Perfect. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm happy everyone can make it to the first session of the day. I'm Michelle Arnold, and I'm part of the Office of Empowering Teaching Excellence here at Utah State University. And I have the honor to present Tom Cunningham, who's from Great Basin College, and he'll be talking about adapting traditional in-person professional learning activities to effectively lead a great online teaching seminar during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure beyond that. So I'm gonna pass that off to you, Tom, and let me know if you need anything. Great, thank you. Well, welcome. And um, I'm excited to be here today. I'm in Nevada right now, and the sun just came up a little while ago. Uh, we're an hour ahead of uh, those who are in the Mountain West, or I mean in Mountain Standard Time. And I understand from <clears throat> Matt's introduction a few minutes ago that we have some people from uh, all over the country and even in some other countries. So uh, I'm excited to introduce the Great Teachers Movement to you. So uh, let me begin. I do have a handout to share, but uh, after over 20 years of teaching, I learned it's a good idea not to share the handout at the beginning if you want to have some surprises. So I'll uh, share it with you all later, but I am going to bring it up on my screen right now. Just a second here, make sure I've got the right window open when I do this. Okay, so you should be seeing the handout that I'll be sharing later. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm an instructional designer and faculty coach and Canvas administrator at Great Basin College. And we have five campuses that are spread across Nevada. And uh, we also have students who take our online courses from across the country, across the United States, and even in some other countries. So I have a little screenshot um, of our first online great, great online teaching seminar that we did back in October, just for GBC faculty. I've been doing the Red Rock Great Teaching Retreat in Utah, uh, not too far from where SUU is, uh, for over 20 years. <clears throat> and we've never gone online before with it. As far as I know, uh, we were among the first to actually go online. We celebrated our 50th anniversary for the Great Teachers Movement in 2019. Uh, the founder of the movement, David Gottschall, was planning on being at that event. We actually went to Illinois where the very first Great Teachers event was held that he started back in 1969. And unfortunately, he died a month before our anniversary event. So I'd be curious to know what he would have thought about this pandemic. And uh, he, he liked face-to-face -face meetings. He'd like to be able to look people in the eye. And suddenly we were, we were faced with this situation where we couldn't do that. And we're finding that we're still not able to do it. I was, uh, normally we have our Red Rock Great Teaching Retreat in February. Sometimes it dips into March. And we were still hoping to be able to meet face-to-face -face this year. Um, but several of the institutions that normally attend still have travel restrictions due to the COVID pandemic. So, uh, and although there were some institutions with faculty who were eager, and I'm sure all of you are eager for face-to-face -face meetings to resume at some point, um, but we couldn't do it. And so uh, we are actually adapting it for uh, a virtual event, the virtual Red Rock Great Teaching Retreat that'll be held in April. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I saw that coming and decided we needed to try to do something online. And way back in May, I proposed it to our faculty at Great Basin College. Uh, we don't have an official faculty development office, but it's part of our job in, at GDC Online or the Online Education Office to do faculty development. We do um, trainings and have uh, professional development workshops. Um, <clears throat> so I had proposed that we do one back when this all started in May, but a, a group of our faculty who had attended in uh, Moab in Utah 
told me there's just too much going on right now. We can't do this. Uh, they were trying to figure out how to handle their classes. Uh, and um, so we decided to put it off. But we, did, we tried it in October. And I decided to start small. I only had just a handful of faculty. I'd never done a Zoom conference before. And I wanted to try it out with just a few people so that um, we could work out the bugs. And there were a few uh, problems that we encountered that I'll share with you. So this is a picture of everybody who attended. I blocked out the last names to uh, protect the innocent, I guess you might say. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the Great Teachers Movement so that to those of you who are unfamiliar with it can understand what it's about. Um, so uh, it focuses on properly tapping into teachers' knowledge. The collective knowledge, experience, wisdom, creativity, expertise, and genius of teachers is a precious resource that can yield extraordinary results when properly tapped. And one of the points that uh, David Gottschall made um, decades ago is that there are very few educational experts that know as much about any group of um, practicing teachers. They're actually on the front lines of teaching. And so the focus of, of the great teachers movement is for teachers to teach each other, not for experts to teach teachers how to teach. So as I mentioned, it was founded in 1969 by David Gottschall. He was at the College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois which is close to Chicago. And the GTM model focuses on properly facilitated shop talk to draw upon the teacher's knowledge and experience. So there's no outside experts that are invited to, to tell or show teacher, teachers how to do their jobs. The participants are the experts. And so the focus is on teachers teaching teachers. And so why is this idea of facilitated shop talk so effective for professional development? And there's evidence that it's effective because it's lasted for 50 years. People keep wanting to participate in this once they've heard about it, understand what it is, and people want to start their own. David Gottschall never copyrighted this on purpose. It's a very simple idea. Um, it helps to actually attend one to understand how it works. Just reading about it um, typically isn't enough to understand how to do it. But um, why is it so effective? It addresses participants' immediate needs. It's relevant to what people want to talk about right now. Um, it avoids treating teachers like tall children. We respect them as professionals. It eliminates or minimizes time wasted complaining about issues beyond teachers' control. It focuses on positively and productively on what teachers have the power to actually change. And it prevents any participants from either holding back or from dominating a discussion. And let me see. Michelle, can you see everything that I have up on the screen? What do you mean by everything I see? Um, the, the second column, what are the key components of teaching workshop? Yep, we see that. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that everybody's seen that. So there, there are three basic components to any great teacher's event. And these are terms that David Gottschall came up with. Rigid minimal structure, and I'll explain each one of these. Excellent facilitators and highly interactive discussions and activities. So rigid and minimal structure is, focus, it is based on the idea of less is more. And less structure equals more flexibility. Uh, a great teaching workshop, retreat, or seminar has a flexible agenda so that it can be quickly adapted to meet participants' immediate needs. So we don't... Uh, publish a detailed agenda, and sometimes people find that a bit disconcerting. But we do that on purpose because if we need to change something, if an activity isn't working, we want to be able to change to something else that is working. There are very few rules, but those rules are rigidly applied. And the three rules are be positive and productive, no whining, griping, or complaining, especially about things that you can't change. And so once you take that off the table, you can focus your time on things that you do have the power to change. That's what we do once the door is closed and we're in our classroom, or now once we're in a Zoom room, what actually happens with your students? Share discussion time equitably, so no one is allowed to dominate 
and no one is allowed to be a wallflower. And that's why we need facilitators, good facilitators. And then we mutually enforce rules one and two. So it's not just the facilitator's job to enforce the rules, it's all the participants job. So if a facilitator starts to dominate the conversation, the participants have the right to call them out. And we try to do that diplomatically. So excellent facilitators gently and diplomatically enforce the rules. They refrain from intruding, biting their lips if they need to. You might see blood coming out of the corner of their mouth because they want to say something. But as a facilitator, their job is to listen and to make sure everybody else gets to participate. Uh, they, they may occasionally jump in if they have something they want to share. But their job is to make sure that everybody else gets the chance to participate. They're, so they actively listen and take notes. And they're, they're listening for recurring themes that we can use for other discussions that you might have in a great teaching event, um, hot topic discussions. Their, their contribution is limited to, to statements like, Bob, what do you think of what Susan just said? So to keep the, the conversation going. So for highly interact, interactive discussions and activities, participants have to come prepared. Uh, they, they write um, two very brief papers. It can all be in one handout. And I'll uh, talk about that a little bit later. Um, so the first thing is a successful teaching strategy, technique, or activity that they've actually used with their students that works for them, that they're going to share. And then they also prepare a short written description about a persistent teaching problem for which they have not yet found a satisfactory solution. And then they share copies of that. There are some other things that might go on that handout, but they, they share that with everyone who's attending. Then uh, one of the first activities that we do in small groups is to, in a group of about six to eight other teachers, they briefly describe their success stories. And then there's a discussion and questions and comments. Um, typically for about an hour with uh, six to eight people that gives everyone a chance to talk about their ideas. And then in a different group um, of, again, six to eight peers, they briefly describe and define the problem that they would like to have some input from their peers on, something they haven't been able to solve that it really matters to them. And then they have a discussion of the issues and possible solutions to each other's problems. That session is usually about 90 minutes because it we need a little bit more time to discuss problems and possible solutions. And then during these, these two discussions on the success stories and on the problems, um, the facilitators are taking notes of the topics that kept coming up. And then later on, we present a list of all those hot topics that the facilitators noticed and then ask the participants, is there something else that's not on this list that you really would like to talk about? And then we organize other sessions uh, during uh, the seminar or retreat where they were talking about topics that they care about. They were on the edge of their seat during the success story discussion and it came up several times, and we see that as a topic that they really cared about. So we have it on a list, we vote, and then we determine um, maybe three or four, depends on how much time we want to devote to it, hot topics that then they can go and attend a session on a specific issue, like using technology or humor in the classroom, or whatever comes up that they care about at that moment. That's part of what makes this really relevant. Um, here's some examples of other um, topics, other idea sharing activities that might come up. A book talk. So we encourage people to bring a book or maybe it's a journal article that influenced them as a teacher. And then they share that. They um, very briefly share why they like that book. This is also something they include in their handout. Um, what uh, is we refer to as non-astounding devices, object lessons, something that might not be publishable in a journal article or anything. It's not big enough to be in a journal article, but something that works for you that's different from the success story that you might like to share with other people. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. One other thing we like to do is identify the, the newest teacher in the group, and we privately ask them if they would be okay to be the center of attention. And if they agree, um, then we do advice for a new teacher. And we go around the room when we're in person or uh, I guess around the virtual room 
and have people offer their advice, what, what they wish somebody had told them when they first started teaching. Uh, there uh, might be short presentations on the characteristics and actions of a great, great teacher. We're on a quest for what a great teacher is, what a great teacher does, and so that's one of the overarching purposes of this kind of event, is to explore that together with those who are there. And then we have a wrap up with uh, what did you learn during the seminar that you plan to use uh, when you go back to class on Monday or Wednesday at the latest. So in this handout that I share, I'll also I also have a section. It's just two pages. Um, so what did I do to adapt this? Because for over 20 years, we've been doing our event in, near Moab, Utah, um, face to face and around the country. Um, They've always been face to face. Most of the events were canceled in 2020. Very few actually went forward. The, the National Great Teachers that meets in Hawaii every year was canceled. There's one in Canada um, that was canceled. Um, I, I'm only aware of two that actually went forward in 2020. Uh, Red Rock, the one we do in Moab, went forward because it happened the week before um, the Teaching for Learning Conference. And so we kind of slipped under the wire and weren't caught up in the pandemic at the end of February last year. So we were actually able to meet. Um, so uh, we used for this um, seminar that I did in October, we used the Canvas Learning Management System for our asynchronous communication, for the prior preparation, and uh, the participant handout exchange which normally we would be face-to-face -face and share all that uh, in the same room. We use Zoom video conferencing for the live synchronous communication during the seminar. Um, some of the adaptations are really simple, um, but we needed to come up with ways to um, do these activities that we do. We have some uh, icebreaker activities where people get to know each other really quickly, and uh, we, need, we, we needed some ways to interact visually. So it might involve uh, waving or raising your hand when we ask a question like, um, okay, in October, we have five campuses and not everybody in Elko knows everybody at the other campuses. In fact, rarely do they see each other. And one of the comments we got um, after our event was, you know, I, I met some people that teach in the same subject area as I do, but we've uh, never really had a conversation. Uh, or people that uh, teach in the Elko campus and somebody that teaches in Pahrump that have never uh, met before. They've never met face-to-face, -face, but they have met online and they've had conversations with each other. Um, so holding up a number of fingers, if I ask you a question and there are two options, uh, hold up one finger if you, whatever the, the response I give, or hold up number two, everybody holds it up on their camera. so we can see how they're responding. Um, I actually need to switch over to not sharing my screen. Just a second. So can you see me now? Michelle? Can I, can I can see me and not my, my screen share? Nope, you're still sharing the screen, Tom. Okay, there. There you go. All right. So one of the things I had them do were create cards for strongly agree, strongly disagree, and so forth. This is one of the activities we have. We want to very quickly be, have everybody say, well, I agree with that statement, or I strongly agree with that statement, and to have that so everybody can see it at once. Um, let's see, I'll switch back to the screen share. How much time do I have left, Michelle? You have till 925. So if you want to take questions, you have about 10 minutes and then five for questions, or you have 15 total. OK, thank you. Let's see. So I'm going to jump out to show you what I actually used. I need to switch over to student view so you're not seeing all the administrative functions of Canvas. So 
um, <clears throat> normally with face to face, I would send out an email to all the participants to let them know what they need to do to prepare. And in this case, I sent them, I gave them access and sent them the link through Canvas with a start here page that gives them some details because most of them, if not all of them, have never really heard of the great teachers movement before. So I provide a lot of what I just described to you that's in the handout. The idea that teachers learn best from each other. Um, creativity is enhanced by purposely mixing teachers of diverse fields, experience levels, and interests to talk about great teaching. That's something that I didn't mention that is a uh, core principle of the great teachers movement. The more diversity that you can have in a group of teachers, the greater possibility for different ideas um, of connecting. What can a math teacher learn from a biology teacher and how to be a better teacher? We actually have a, a whole lot in common, more in common than we have uh, differences um, other than the content that we teach. Um, so I've mentioned most of this already. Here's a picture of our 2019 event in Moab. And so here's some of the differences uh, with prior preparation. Um, I needed to make sure that everybody was committed to fully participate. When you when you meet in person, you're there. You are committed. You've got a hotel room you're staying in. You have food that's been prepared for you. You're, and that's one of the advantages of meeting in person in a retreat location where everybody has to get away from their campus. Nobody can sneak off and uh, do something in their office. Um, so you have their undivided attention, hopefully. Although you're in such a beautiful place, some people want to go off and see the national park that's nearby. Well, we allow time. We actually include time on in our schedule to do that in a face-to-face. -face. So I want to make sure that they're committed to participate in every seminar activity because every, the other participants are counting on everybody else to be uh, available and actively involved. I mentioned it's not a traditional academic conference where you can slip away to go sightseeing or do something else. So uh, for a virtual event, a computer, obviously a good internet connection, a webcam and microphone with a built-in uh, microphone or headset might be better. And a quiet space where you can participate in video conferencing without being disturbed. And then um, full participation at a great teaching seminar requires a little bit of prior preparation. So I mentioned that they need to do a handout. And they're going to be submitting that. Here's some instructions for what we wanted them to include. I mentioned the teaching success, the unresolved teaching problem, object lesson, device or activity, a book that influenced them or a journal article. And then here's, here's another difference. Uh, we provide food when we go to the uh, Red Cliffs Lodge in Moab. Here, we still need to have food, but they're going to be providing their own. That way I don't have to worry about food allergies and that sort of thing in my planning because they provide their own and hopefully they get something they really like so they can enjoy it. Uh, we also have a working lunch where we actually meet together during lunch, divide up into small groups. A lot of important interaction happens at a great teaching seminar during what David Gottschall called the between times, the breaks, the coffee breaks and so on where um, people are interacting with each other. They need to have paper and marking pins and uh, response cards. In, at the in-person event, we provide a folder with a notepad and cards and a pen and all that sort of thing that they might need. But they need to provide that themselves. They need to be aware that they need all of that. And then always what to wear. Um, let them know that they can dress casually. They don't need to wear anything fancy. And then we do provide a brief schedule to show how the day is going to go, but not the details of how we're going to use our time from 8.30 to 9.00 or 9.00 to 12.00. Okay, so um, that is the fire hose view. I've given you a whole lot of information about the great teachers movement and some of the adaptations that I had to do. Um, I'd, I'd like to tell you a little bit about, I'm gonna stop screen sharing now about um, some problems that I ran into. One of them was the breakout sessions. Um, I had done my homework with Zoom 
And there's a way to preset the breakout sessions so that you can put people into them and everything is set up. So you just click a button and push everybody out into their session. Well, uh, there was a little bit of a, a problem with that because we had one of our facilitators was sick that, that day that we did it. So I was without a facilitator and one of our participants um, didn't attend. And so I had to adjust my groups. I have a, my own approach for how to organize these groups. I mentioned for maximum diversity, uh, we try to mix it so nobody from the same institution is in the same group as much as possible, that at least they're not from the same department so that they're mixing with people, maybe from their own institution, but from different departments. And in every possible way, there's diversity so that we can draw upon that in um, in all of, all of our discussion activities. So that sort of through all the planning I had done is I had organized all these small groups well in advance um, based on my criteria. And that was all just thrown out the door because two people didn't show up. So the num numbering didn't match and the organization didn't match. So um, I had to come up with a plan very quickly to reorganize all that and learned that it's better, at least for what, what I do with great teachers, to have that all on paper so I can um, organize those rooms during a break. So we do the, let's say the success story. And I send everybody into that room. I already have that fairly well pre-organized. And then during the break between the success story and the problem paper discussion, um, I, everybody else is chatting, doing whatever they need to do. We, we give them a restroom break. They can go whatever they need to do with that break, come back and chat with each other. I'm busy as the coordinator organizing the next session because it didn't work to use the pre-planned function in Zoom. Um, so little things can really mess things up. So that's why flexibility is really critical in the great teachers movement. Um, let's see. So I, I don't know how much, how much time do I have left for any questions? I've been dominating this conversation and I should have been facilitating, but I needed to uh, get this information out there to you. You have about seven minutes left, Tom. Okay, so I'd like to take the rest of the time um, for any questions that you might have. And Michelle, before I jump into that, what's the best way to get the handout to everyone who's here in this session? I guess I could do a chat and then uh, attach it. Let's see, yes. I'm going to attach that file right now if I can. So if anybody has a question, feel free. I am uh, locating that file right now. Um, what kind of stumbling blocks do you, if you get any, of instructors who don't really want to engage in the virtual, in the virtual environment? They're holding a bias against it. Thank, thank you for um, asking that. Actually, we had one college that had a team of six faculty who wanted to come to Moab. And when we went virtual, none of those six people wanted to attend. They want to wait. We've already got our date set for 2022. Hopefully we'll be able to do that. Um, but they had eight other people that were actually interested in coming to the virtual Red Rock Great Teaching Retreat. So it worked out. It worked itself out.
I, I've got a question. Can I? Yes, please, Steve. Um, yeah, uh, and this is, this is a question that comes from working with people both virtually and in person. What do you do? Because I love this idea of having the facilitators just stay out of it. What do you do if you're a facilitator and you just hear a singularly bad idea catching on? You're like, I know that they just recommended what's probably going to create the least amount of learning in the classroom, right? Hey, I think what you really need to do is break it down, block practice and drill. And you're like, that's really catching on and everybody loves it because it's what they think. How, how do you deal with that really bad idea that creeps in? So the facilitator doesn't have to completely shut up and sit back. Um, but one, one of the important things is that the members of, the, of that small group don't look to the facilitator as the expert in the room. I mean, you're, you can add your opinion. In fact, we do ask the facilitators to come prepared and share their own handout, but they go last. If there's no time left, then you know, they're, they're the one that loses out, not the other people who were in the group. So they can jump in, but you should also be prepared that there will be disagreement with you. You think that what uh, somebody has proposed doesn't work. Well, they have certainly the right to give their opinion of why they think it does. So the facilitator, facilitator doesn't have to completely stay out of it, but they need to remember that their job is not to be the expert in the room. In fact, one of our things that we teach in our facilitator training is to not look at the, at the person who's talking, not look at the participant who's talking, because that participant will normally look you right back in the eye and do their presentation to you. They see you as the leader in the room, but you don't want to, a, a good facilitator will look down at their notes, look at somebody else, um, so that the person who's sharing their idea is not looking at them. Does that make sense? Yeah, those are some great suggestions, thanks. Other questions? Well, I shared that handout um, in the chat and wherever else I can share it, I will. Uh, Tom, you can, you can also in your event page under the comment section, you can post it there for everybody as well. Okay, great. So there is a link on that handout um, to inf information about the National Great Teachers Movement. And there are some details about other conferences. Uh, most of them still doesn't look like they're going to be meeting this year. At least they haven't announced a date. Um, and I also gave a link for the Red Rock Great Teaching Retreat. We have had people attend in Moab because it's such a beautiful place. People want to to come to Utah, they'll look for an excuse to go to an academic related conference in a beautiful place. So we do, we recognize that. And we've had people actually come from other countries and other states, not in uh, our local area. Although most of the people who attend are from Utah, Nevada, Arizona. But um, so there, there's definitely advantages to meeting in person in a retreat like location that has an awe-inspiring view, but um, we can't do that right now. So all of you, anybody who wants to learn how this works, um, I'm the behind the scenes guy. Um, Gary Parnell is the one who introduced me to the Great Teachers Movement. He's retired from um, teaching now, but he still helps out as a director. He, he will be the director of our Red Rock Great Teaching Retreat. He's normally the director in face-to-face, He'll also be the director in our virtual event. And uh, you're welcome to join us. Uh, I'd love to have any of you there that would like to be there. And it really makes a difference to participate in the activities to see how this works. And if any of you are interested in developing your own 
retreat. If you're looking at this and thinking, wow, I'd really like to do this, I've actually helped quite a few colleges um, and uh, statewide institutions to understand how to use this and given uh, them um, customized seminars, retreats, workshops. So I also have information about that if you're interested in following up with me later. Other questions? Well, thank you, Tom. We appreciate you giving your presentation today and being part of the T4L conference. If there's anything you need from us, please let us know. And if there are any questions further from Tom, you can carry on the conversation in the Mighty Networks and he'll get back to you. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you all for um, your attention. Tom, you can Thanks. stop the recording now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Let's see. All right. I had to look for the item.